This is Matt Hurt at Obsessive Viewer on Twitter. This is Tiny at Obsessive Tiny on Twitter. And this is Mike, and you can find me at I am Mike White on Twitter. And this is ObsessiveViewer.com's The Obsessive Viewer Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Obsessive Viewer Podcast. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, if this is your first time listening, we are a weekly movie and TV podcast that covers a specific topic, be a genre, trope, movie, or show each episode. And for the returning listeners, thank you. Uh, I'm here today with, uh, as always, with Mike and Tiny. Hey, guys. Hello. Hey. And uh, today we're talking about favorite movie dialogue. Yeah, and by the way, if this is not your first time listening, uh, you know that picking favorites at anything is really, really difficult for us. It really is. It's difficult for you, Mike. I don't know what you're talking Di- about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, this, I mean, I spoke, I really, really labored over this, over this thing. And, and so, like, I was trying to figure out, are we talking about the best dialogue? Are we talking about our favorite dialogue scenes? Are we talking about, best or favorite i don't know um and i think i want to say before i give mine i have a list of seriously like nine and even (laughs) before we started um we were talking and i I said to matt help me pick three Uh, and so we picked three that i think are going to work conversationally but i don't think they are three favorites by any mean they just Mm -hmm. have they just happen to be three good ones yeah and i think it's important that we kind of address like what because i mean favorite movie dialogue that's that's a pretty broad uh broad topic i guess yeah it's something that i mean it's i i kind of i think i came up with this this category thinking like okay well favorite movie dialogue it's something we can we can pull from that well later also but um so what did you guys have in mind when you picked your three or however many we get to uh, in this uh episode tiny what were the parameters of picking these examples you know it's it was really just stuff that kind of stuck out to me as far as like how clever it is or sometimes how quick-witted it is or sometimes it's the the importance of the dialogue that's actually happening um the impact it has on the film it's it's i didn't really have super set parameters for it it was really just stuff that i remembered like Man, I remember these lines, and it just stuck in my head so much. Um, <laughs> I know when we when we first started talking about it, Tiny, you like rattled off three like that. You called dibs, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the first thing I did was try to think of my one of my favorite Aaron Sorkin film scenes, <laughs> right. and so that's how I came to my first one. And from there, it just kind of sort of opened up. I, I, I start one of the things I I hooked or like hooked onto or latched onto is I tried to think of my favorite. Um, writers my favorite playwrights if you will um aaron sorkin's towards the top screenwriters screenwriters thank yeah. you <laughs> playwrights. he's a playwright too he is he is fugan memos originally a, a play yes yes yeah. uh and then you know pt anderson oh, is another yeah. one towards the top so that's that's kind of how i came to mind it, it wasn't a whole lot of formula to it what about yeah. you guys uh mine was kind of interesting because i immediately went to one also sorkin which i'll get to here in a bit but um, the other one, I, I had like two, two set aside and they they were kind of, I mean, I don't want to, not to cheapen these, these writers or anything, but I mean, it was like, it was Sorkin and it was Tarantino and it's like, a- after a while I was like, okay, well yeah, the Tarantino one I picked was, a, is a really great scene, but I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about this other thing, which I'll get to later. I'm being really vague and that's <laughs> stupid, but, um, my point is like I picked a, a Sorkin scene and uh and then and then this other one is kind of a kind of one that I I couldn't go with, go without bringing up but it was it was also a pretty tough decision for me um yeah and Mike you struggled with yours obviously I did struggle and I and I tried to pick ones that um that I know that if you have listened to this show before or you know me 
uh, and I'm talking about the two of you knowing me, mm-hmm. you'll, you'll kind of know where I'm coming from, but also ones that I think speak to a general public. I really didn't want to pick super deep cuts. Uh, I'll tell you right now, one of, one of my movies was going to be Good Night and Good Luck. Uh, which is about Edward R. Murrow and mm. him doing kind of battle on <laughs> CBS with, uh, um, McCarthy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his, his kind of rebuttal to McCarthy was one of my favorites. And I love that movie, but it's so under the radar. Um, mm-hmm. and I think people have really forgotten about that movie, unfortunately, because it's a great movie that I kind of just had to let that one slip. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been perfect, though, because that's, that's basically 90 minutes of people sitting around talking. Right. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and it is great dialogue, uh, uh, written, of course, by George Clooney. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, He wrote that one? He is a co-writer, yep. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huh. Yep. Wow. And so, I mean, he didn't write the McCarthy stuff. That's actually... Well, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but... uh but yeah, it, uh, it's, it's great. It's a great movie. And like I said, it's underrated. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think people remember it anymore. Uh, it was kind of overshadowed by, of course, Walk the Line when it came out in 05. Right. Um, so I kind of let that one slip. But, oh. but I think, I think we're going to talk about some good ones. I, you know, yeah. um, Tiny, I'm surprised. Are you going with any sports movies, Tiny? Nope. I didn't think so. And I was going to say, uh, not that I'm surprised that you didn't, but I almost expected you to say a sports one because we've talked on the show about uh, before about how when uh, when a sports movie is good, they're really good. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I thought of several scenes as as cheesy as uh, <laughs> you know, um, I don't want your life, or <laughs> you know, for the for the next 24 minutes or whatever, uh, <laughs> the last I, whatever Vanderbeek says at the yeah. University Blues. Right. <laughs> And then uh, Al Pacino and Any Given Sunday. So there's a lot of great sports ones. And I bring that up because uh, Rocky Balboa, when when he speaks to his son Robert about getting up after you've been punched and knocked down is Mm -hmm. what makes makes a strong person. Uh, And so I didn't go with that one either. Nice. So... Let's uh, let's get to our first one. But but first, uh, let me clarify. We're we're doing specific scenes. Yes. Right? Yes. And right. uh, yeah. So who wants to go first? Well, I've been talking a lot. So one of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I can go first if you want. Okay. Yeah. Go right ahead, Tiny. Okay. The one that I am most excited to talk about is the Aaron Sorkin one. It immediately popped into my head. Uh, this is the film Charlie Wilson's War. And uh, the scene that I want to talk about is I, I just call it the scotch scene because um, it involves a bottle of scotch. Um, it's sort of a it's almost like a, a catalyst to, to sort of to, to sit at the center of the scene. It's, it's really brilliant. Um, and the reason why I picked this scene, it's not overly important to the film, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. It's, it's 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 kind of just a meeting sort of um but what's amazing about the scene is the structure of it because it involves two different conversations that involves geez like four different people or shoot it's i think it's like five or six different people yeah, even more than that because the women right I mean, yeah there's three of them mm-hmm. um and these two conversations are not privy to one another um so if you or they're not supposed to be <laughs> uh if you haven't seen the movie it's about a, a congressman in the 80s who uh, helped successfully perpetrate the largest covert war ever in human history. Um, and it's, it's just a really, uh, it's a story no one knew about until they really, until the book came out and then the movie came out. Um, it's really good. Um, but in this scene, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman plays a, um, he's a, a CIA agent, essentially. And, uh, Tom Hanks is a uh, congressman from Texas, Congressman Wilson. And so what's happened is he's being he some guy that he was friends with uh that the 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 congressman was friends with is being he got arrested and he's being indicted and he chose to flip uh the congressman and say that he saw him doing cocaine and so that's being released uh, publicly and so he and his staff are trying to deal with that but at the same time he's in a meeting with Philip Seymour Hoffman who's the CIA CIA agent and they're meeting about how to help the uh, Afghans defeat the Soviets in Afghanistan. And it's just back and forth because he keeps asking Philip Seymour Hoffman to leave the room so he's not privy to the information that he's <laughs> divulging to his staff. 
then they'll leave, then Philip Seymour Hoffman will come back in, and they'll leave, and it's just, it's so brilliant. And then you find out partway through that Philip Seymour Hoffman has bugged the bottle of scotch, and he's been listening the whole time. <laughs> and just the way he addresses it, he's like, he's like, I bugged the bottle of scotch, let's get past it. It's just <laughs> That's so, right. It's so funny. And Tom Hanks is like, were you listening at the door? That's a thick door. <laughs> I just, I love that line. That's a and- thick door. That's a thick door. And then just the way uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman passively brushes it off. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I was standing at the door. <laughs> exactly. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, just the, 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 it's, it kind of, it's sort of, it is sort of important because it kind of fuses this relationship between these two men. Um, they're, they're different in some ways, but they're similar in others. They're both just kind of masters of their craft. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character, uh, Gustav Ricardos, which is such an awesome name, <laughs> is uh, a really brilliant spook or spy or whatever you want to call him, uh, intelligence guy. And then Charlie Wilson just knows how to play the game, which is completely evident in the film. It's really brilliant. Um, and these two just come together, and w- through their craft, they perpetrate this amazing feat of <laughs> logistics and <laughs> warfare, and it's it's just really impressive. Um, nice. I, th- I think... The, the cap on the beautiful cap on the conversation is is when uh charlie wilson says well you're not exactly james bond and he says well you're not exactly thomas jefferson so let's call it even <laughs> uh, it's just it is just a beautifully crafted scene that takes such an immense and and perfect effort from the cameraman the actors the writer the director just the sound guys it's just nice. it is it's like a dance it's just a really beautiful brilliant scene and that's what some of Sorkin's like best, best, best scenes are like. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Do you guys have anything more to say about Charlie Wilson's work? Because I could just use that to segue right into mine. <laughs> well, I'll I'll try to I'll try to keep your segue relevant. But uh, okay. the I think what works so well about that scene is, like you said, just the combination of so many awesome powers working at once. Mm-hmm. Um, but. I think we're going to try not to thread too many together. Uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about A Few Good Men. Basically, right. I've spent the last 10 minutes talking about what I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> um, uh, but I think we we should mention that we could do a show about great Philip Seymour Hoffman dialogue scenes. God, oh, yeah, and we could do a show about great Tom Hanks dialogue scenes. And it just it says a lot about that scene that there's two... There's two great ones in there. So um, it's it's cool that we won't be talking about movies featuring the two of those characters el- elsewhere. But gosh, we could. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that the, the entire time we're, we're pra- like Tiny's explaining the scene. And I, granted, it's for it's for this sp- specific topic. But we have two like masters of acting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the scene. Yeah. And we're talking about how well crafted the how well the constructed it is. Yeah. Which is just a, a big mark for that movie as a whole. Did that? Did that get any Oscar buzz or anything like it that? It got a couple. Yeah, uh, Philip Seymour buzz, Hoffman. But it didn't win anything. I didn't yeah, think Philip so. Seymour Hoffman was nominated, I'm pretty sure. Okay. And I think uh, Aaron Sorkin may have been nominated, but I'm, hmm. I can't remember. Yeah, it, did, it, f- it feels like it flew a little bit under the radar, which is it did. a shame because it's it's a really good movie. It is. Um, which yeah. also, there are several other great dialogue scenes in that movie. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, when Philip Seymour Hoffman tells off his boss in his office and breaks the window. Oh my yeah. god! Just he's just <laughs> oh, he's that could have won him an Oscar. Just that scene right there. Right. Yeah. God, I need to watch that movie. It's a terrific. Movie. So Aaron Sorkin, he's a guy. Yes. <laughs> who is responsible for the first scene that I'm going to throw into this discussion? Um, it's an it's the opening scene of the Social Network. Um, it's it's five minutes and twenty seconds long, <laughs> and it's two people. At, in a bar, sitting across from each other, talking rapid fire, and it encapsulates the entire character of Mark Zuckerberg in that one scene. Mm-hmm. And it is truly incredible. It's, uh, it's such a great introduction to the movie and just the kind of overarching themes that will play out through the next two hours. Um, and it, it's, it's just, it really, it does such a fine, not fine, but just, brilliant job of showcasing Mark Zuckerberg's insecurities and his, uh, no pun intended, his obsessive nature. <laughs> um, but it also shows how much he cares about status and how, cause like he's, he's, he's talking to Erica played by Rooney, uh, Rooney Mara 
and it's basically they're they're talking, and it goes from him him talking about uh, an anecd- sharing an anecdote about how everyone in Ch- like more people have genius IQs in China than people have uh, uh, than people have gotten a sixteen hundred on their SATs or something like that. something some some anecdotal thing about geniuses in China and how they over like they have more people it's they have more geniuses in China than the entire population of the U S something like that. So then Mark Zuckerberg mm-hmm. says, uh, says that like it, it just, that it flows so organically from that springboard. It goes from that to him kind of boasting a little bit that he got a 1600 on his SAT to him talking about wanting to get in a final club, into, uh, finals clubs. And then, and then him having kind of, kind of an argument with her, um, about what she intended to say about final uh, the final club or whatever finals and then, clubs finals clubs i was i was trying to remember which one it was <laughs> yeah um well she says finals and he says final clubs right right yeah. so and it's just it's like like through erica and and this is the part that because it's it's like i said it's such a rapid fire sequence that it's easy to say like okay he they're showcasing that like he's he's a genius he's 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 a little bit on the Asperger side of genius, <laughs> but he's a genius nonetheless. But it's also that through, through Erica and her reactions and, and her, the way that she kind of spells out pretty much, pretty much the, the themes of the movie mm-hmm. and, uh, and the, the, um, his character traits in general. Um, but through her, we kind of learn just right off the bat what, uh, what, his character traits mean to people around him, like how people view him and how he uses those, his insecurities amplify the way that people uh, feel about him. Like her final line of the, like the entire scene is punctuated by her after having bro- broken up with him saying like, you're going to go through life thinking that girls uh, don't like you because you're a nerd, but I'm here to tell you that it's not because they, they don't like you because you're a nerd. They don't like you because you're an ass. <laughs> And it's just, it's such a perfect way to, to just show the main protagonist. And, and it's, uh, I have a lot of notes about this. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, I'll talk briefly about the, just the clever turns in the dialogue alone. Like not talking about the themes of the movie or anything like that. But like I said, it goes from, um, like there, there are several callbacks throughout, throughout the, um, the scene that, that are callbacks to earlier in the scene. Like they talk about rowing crew. They talk about like, like each one of them asks if they, uh, uh, if the, the other wants to get some food and each time they say that, and it's an, it's in a completely different context. Like <laughs> Erica's kind of bored and she's like, do you want to get some food? And then they, and then once they have, uh, have their big, their big fight and everything, uh, Mark is like, do you want to get some food? And it's like, he's like struggling to keep her there and all that. It's just, <laughs> it's so great. Wow. Um, and then just, it's, it's the perfect, the, the ebb and flow of the scene is like a perfect example of Sorkin's writing style because it isn't just fast paced. It's just beautifully constructed as we talked about in, in Charlie Wilson's war. And it just, it gives the movie more of a voice mm-hmm. than, than, not not to not to discredit the performances or anything like that because they're they're all like great, but it just it just gives this this little little extra to to what's going on and a, a lot of that's also probably uh, Fincher's directing which he is like a madman behind the camera like he mm-hmm. I, I can't remember how what the stats are but he like they reshot that scene like so many times or he took so many different takes. I think it was like literally 90 takes or something. Something like that. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that's just how, that, that's just how doesn't, Fincher doesn't works. Doesn't Shining have the record I don't for know. most takes in a scene? And I, and I think it's only, or I think it's like 110 takes or something like that. I know, I know it's a Kubrick movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it is The Shining. I'm pretty sure it's yeah. The Shining. Yeah. yeah. But Fincher is the same way. He'll, he'll exhaust his actors by, by doing like all, he's a perfectionist. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, just to, just to sum up this opening sequence of the social network, it goes from an an anecdote about geniuses in China to talking about Mark's future to displaying Mark's vulnerability slash jealousy of guys prone to athletics, which is the main, one of the main, uh, 
I guess, I guess conflicts of the movie, I guess, uh, through the story, um, through his eyes at least, uh, and then turns into an argument and then a breakup as Mark is just completely branded as an ass. And it all takes place in five minutes. Yeah. In a five minute span. And it's just, it's awe inspiring. <laughs> um, so what did you guys think of the opening scene of the social network? You know, um, I, I'll, I'll kind of stray from that for just a second. I, I, th- it's interesting that we decided um, to go with one scene, and we also kind of talked beforehand about picking a scene that is a microcosm for the rest of the movie, right? And yeah. uh, is the best example of kind of the overall themes of the movie. Mm-hmm. We talked about that, and we and we agreed on that, and absolutely one hundred percent spot on. That is that scene in that movie. Absolutely. Um, if. However, we were talking about the best scene or the best lines of dialogue. I don't think that's the one. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering Agreed. if your choice, if your guys' choice is going to be the one that I have in my notes right here. <laughs> so what well, would you say is the uh, best scene? Um, I don't know. The one that comes to mind is uh, the Winklevoss court case where he says, if you were the inventors of Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> I is have, that the other one? No, I, I don't think that's the same scene that I have, but I have that from that same setting is where he's uh, uh, where, where their lawyer asks him if he has their attention. Yes, that's the yeah. one I was thinking he's, of. Yeah. He just destroys him. He's like, yeah. uh, uh, you have some attention. of my attention. You have the minimum amount. Yeah, he's like, he's yeah. like my uh, my my attention is focused on on yeah. Facebook, where where. Uh, my friends and I are are doing things that nobody in this room, especially and in, or including and especially your clients, are not are not um, uh, mentally or creatively capable of doing. Yeah. Um. And then and then he says that line about except he attention. said it with a perfect cadence. Exactly. Yeah. He didn't stumble over yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, you could argue it's, that 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 scene, that sequence, that line of dialogue is is also an encapsulation of of kind of the the bigger story of the movie because the movie is about Mark Zuckerberg and how he is an outcast and all that. But it's also about kind of this, uh, this, uh, this statement about creative minds, I guess it is, Uh, but you get that in the first scene and what the first scene does more of or better then is the, the fabricated love story that Sorkin made for the movie is there. So if you're going to bookend it with her, um, then you then the start of the movie is is the is the best scene right. and you know what a great movie should be that the the scene that is the is the microcosm for the entire movie should mm-hmm. be your first 10 minutes you should know what's going on you should know who the characters are mm-hmm. absolutely and especially with a movie like this that's that it is a character study of granted it's a it's a fictionalized it's a fictionalized character of uh a fictionalized version of Mark Zuckerberg, but it is—he's telling uh, it's a, a story. It's a movie version of a fictionalized book, right? <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, which is the other thing. It's a—it's a tertiary story, right? It's not the movie. Isn't the Mark Zuckerberg story? It's the social network, and it's about socializing and and, and right. kind of that kind right, of right, right. themes mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I love the scene because it sets up. The character of Mark Zuckerberg, I have no idea what the real Mark Zuckerberg is like, but right. the character in the movie, it sets him up as an egotist. Yeah. He's just only involved and thinks about himself. And I think that's important in a movie like this because if that's what you're trying to do with your character, you need to establish it right off the bat because in kind of a high, high powered business litigation type movie like this, it's, a lot of people just assume that you're dealing with a person who's highly ambitious. Yeah. And they just want to make money and make a name for themselves. I think this character was just, an, he was an egotist. And I don't think he was necessarily ambitious. I think he was just kind of an idealist. Yeah. Because he says, he talks early on in the movie about how he makes that early software for music. I don't remember what it's called, but he just, he's like, they're like, oh, how much did you sell that for? And he's like, <laughs> uploaded it for free. Yeah. And, you know, and Facebook is still free. It always has been free. Uh, obviously, he makes a little bit of money on it. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, I think, I think the character is just an idealist in the movie. Yeah. And he, he's so focused on the image of it. I don't know. Right. He's and, an egotist. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that whole idea of him not really caring about money is also kind of, uh, called back later in the movie when, uh, Eduardo was talking to the, the, the people, the business people about, uh, the shares and stuff before he realizes he's just gotten screwed out of the company. But he's like, they're talking to him about, 
about redistributing the shares and stuff like that. And he's like, well, Mark doesn't really care about money, but he does need to be protected. So mm. it's like, it's just like this little kind of like almost throwaway line, but it's kind of like, yeah, kind of that presence is there that he's, he's not, right. he's not very conscious of the, of the, uh, the monetary possibilities of Facebook, <laughs> but it's also kind of a, uh, it, it it also going back to the whole him being a creative kind of a creative genius kind of person. It's I think this is in one of the DVD commentaries on the on it, but they talk about the scene right after he launches Facebook, like just launches the site, and it's kind of where Eduardo's sitting behind him with his laptop open, and he's like, um, he's like, are are you praying? And it's just <laughs> you just see Mark just sitting in his chair with his eyes closed, and he's just kind of like kind of like swaying, and it's kind of like this meditative state that he's like, it's plays off it that he's so exhausted that he's finally like resting but it's also like he's just like his his work is complete there yeah his, there is no happier moment yeah exactly it's an artist no. finishing his masterpiece right right it's like um you know i've i've gone on to say that that is uh it is my favorite movie if not one of my favorite movies from 2010s mm-hmm. so when I when I do my top movies in another four years, four and a half years, five years, um, I, I it'll be interesting to see what stacks up against that. Mm-hmm. I've also said before how much I hate that the King's Speech won Best Picture uh, <laughs> that year over The Social Network. I think that's criminal. I don't think it's criminal, but I think The Social Network is a better movie. Yeah, I was gonna make a stupid joke. The King, that it's a nice love story between K- the King and his Peach. Um. Talking about a movie with good dialogue, that had, that had really good dialogue, though. It did. It had better performance. Yeah, it had some pretty good dialogue. The performances were better than the dialogue. Sure. The performances yes, up to the dialogue. Yeah. Agreed. You guys just agreed. want to talk about The Social Network for an hour? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> uh, we could, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I love so much about this show, this episode, is mm-hmm. is, is the, the types of things we're highlighting and what we could talk about instead, mm-hmm. <laughs> the conversations we could be having. The, yeah. well, the well is deep. Right. Yeah. It is. This tree has roots. <laughs> it is. Uh, so, Mike, what's your first uh, first pick? Um, so I hesitated to do this one because it is so damn obvious. And it's a movie we've <laughs> talked about before. Uh, and it is one of the three movies of the 2000s that I think is is the best movie. Um, Little Nicky. And I, and I want to talk about The Dark Knight. <laughs> the Dark Knight. Nice. Yeah. What are you laughing about? Uh, I, I said it's Little Nicky. <laughs> Oh, I, I want to talk about Little Nicky. <laughs> uh, so the Dark that Knight did come out in the two thousands, didn't it? I, I was gonna say uh, Jack and Jill, but I was like, well, Jack yeah. and Jill's two thousand ten. Exactly. I wanted to, I wanted to keep it. Uh, yeah. You know, Little Nicky. Uh, anyway, so the Dark Knight. <laughs> anyway, the Dark Knight is such a great, great movie for so many reasons more than people acknowledge, mm-hmm. and so I kind of have a, a chip on my shoulder about the Dark Knight. Uh, as a Batman fan and a comic book fan and, and a movie fan. Um, and, and I, I educate young people. Uh, and so I, I see the influence of that movie on young people and how they kind of gravitated toward and latched on to the Joker stuff. And don't get me wrong. Please understand that I think that, that, um, Heath Ledger's Joker was, was a revelation. I mean, he was oh, transcendent yeah. in that movie, but, He wasn't the only unbelievable thing about that movie. Mm -hmm. And so the scene that I want to talk about uh, is not a Joker scene. And I'm intentionally talking about it because it's not a Joker scene. And I want to talk about the the end scene, the last scene in the movie. Um, Excuse me, I have to pardon my voice. Um, Basically, when when they decide, Gordon and... Uh, Batman decide to pin the the murders that were committed by Harvey Dent and the murder of Harvey Dent, the death of Harvey Dent on Batman, uh, so that the city would still have its white knight and and continue to believe that everything is going to be okay and that um, the best of them wouldn't turn on them. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and so he says a line. He says a couple lines. He says, um, sometimes people deserve more. Sometimes people deserve to have their faith rewarded, which I think is excellent. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then later on, um, Gordon's son asks him, why are we letting him go? Why do we have to chase him? 
And he says, because he can take it, because he's the hero Gotham deserves, but not the one he needs right now, the one it needs right now. We'll hunt him because he can take it, because he's our hero. Sorry, not because he's our hero. He's a silent garden, a watchful protector, a dark knight. Um, so I have to admit freely that this isn't the smartest scene Nolan ever wrote. <laughs> <laughs> By a long shot. Um, people, we on this podcast sing Nolan's praises all the time, and I think he certainly has his flaws. Um, dialogue isn't usually it. I, I think he writes interesting visual pieces around dialogue. Um, but he's really good at dialogue. But this, again, is not even close to one of the smartest lines of dialogue he ever wrote. It is not the opening scene to... Uh, to the social network um, <laughs> and it is easily the most comic book ish dialogue in the movie mm -hmm. you know it, it's a, a movie we've called several times a crime drama set in the world of batman but mm -hmm. damned if it doesn't give me chills oh me too uh, placed at the end of the movie such as it is it's the centerpiece of the whole trilogy that couple of lines of dialogue is the centerpiece of the whole trilogy it's a theme about faith being rewarded and how he can be a symbol uh for what gotham needs and and he's the dark knight he's the protector that they need despite uh what they think they want it is the theme it is the centerpiece of the trilogy it's a theme they touch on in an expository sense in the first movie and it's a theme they rely on perhaps maybe a little too heavily in the third one um but the people deserve to have their faith rewarded is a great line mm -hmm. um i don't think nolan is a religious man I, I think there's evidence in his movies that points otherwise um and i think that this line in particular is in support of it despite the fact that he says the word faith i think it's a support of faith in humanity Mm -hmm. um and it's the idea that people can do right or do what necessary what's necessary it also shows that batman is a little crazy which i love because <laughs> batman is cr a crazy person he is crazy yeah. um he's insane the the also the last few lines the last few words because he's not our hero he's a silent garden a watchful protector he is a dark knight like i said it's so comic booky but it works because they're spoken to a child Right. Huh. He's speaking to his son. They wouldn't work otherwise because it's it's nursery rhyme poetry. Right. It sounds <laughs> right. like a comic book. Yeah. But when he's speaking to Gordon's son, we can appreciate the appreciate the dialogue right along with him. It's a masterstroke. I think more than people realize the movie, like I said, is better than just a showcase for the Joker. And this scene in particular, these few lines of dialogue and how they're set up, I think is is my best example. Why? I agree completely. And I, I would like to imagine that there's a scene like right after that, like that big, like, like boom, the dark night thing, uh, uh -huh. where the kids like, dad, I'm not listening to you. I almost just died. I have pissed <laughs> all down my leg. Yeah. You sure have a concussion. Uh, I'm going to need years of therapy and you're talking about a, f I don't care. Yeah, I just, right. But yeah, no, the, seriously. Well, like, it's not there, but yeah. Yeah. But any, the entire time you were talking about that. And I think this is a, this is both, a testament to Nolan's work in the movie and also to Hans Zimmer because the entire time you were saying this, I was playing in my head the music that played in that scene. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's our watchful guardian is the name of the track, but it's that scene is so powerful and I, it gives me chills every time I see it. And that, that dialogue, like you said, is the centerpiece of the trilogy. And I yeah. agree wholeheartedly. Thank you. <laughs> it, you know, all of the Joker scenes, all of them make me go, Oh snap. <laughs> There's the interrogation scene that is, that is just phenomenal. Mm. Perfectly shot, perfectly ad acted. Um, there's, you know, the, when it, do you want to see a magic trick? Everything. He, he is so good. But the best dialogue in the movie, the theme of the movie is at the end. And, and it, it bums me out that I think people miss that. I think they mm -hmm. recognize that it's good. I think people get chills at the end, but nobody talks about how great of a Batman movie that is still. I think people are talking about it. Tiny, what do you so? think of it? Oh, yeah, totally. I don't think people talk about it. In, to, to what Mike was saying, I don't think people talk about it as a Batman movie. Right. People talk about it as a standalone movie. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, Mike, I love you, buddy. <laughs> because well, just listening to you say that, I've, I've seen this movie at least seven or eight times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Until this moment, 
I had never considered the importance of the fact that that line is being delivered to a child before. Me neither, uh, cool. actually. That has never <laughs> stuck out to me, and now I'm seeing it in a totally different light. Yeah, cool. So, coup freaking dose, man. That was really uh, well done. Because it, it is. If if he was explaining that, if if, it, if he was talking to an adult, that line would not be in the movie. Because right. an adult would be like, oh, yeah, because you know, he has to take it because... There's just, you don't need to explain it. It's completely understandable <laughs> to an adult. It's like, oh yeah, of course right. we need to, we need to do this, but because right, it's but a as kid. fans and kids are seeing this movie, they need to hear that. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. That's yeah. that's a, well done. Good good analyzation. Yeah, good Thanks, job, man. man. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it makes me all the more excited to talk about Interstellar next week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm glad to hear you. Uh, cheer up about Interstellar. You had me so down about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wait till we talk. <laughs> oh no, really? And we'll uh, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it in next week's episode. It'll be a good episode. I have n- copious notes. Wow. Um. So yeah, The Dark Knight. Uh, do we have anything else to say about? Uh, do we have anything more to say about The Dark Knight? Never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, I think Mike. I think you sub- summed it up perfectly. Thank um, you. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So now we're circling back to Tiny. Uh, yes. What's your next pick for my number two selection? I uh, I'm choosing one of the movies that I consider to be one of the top three, probably best of the 2010s. Nice. Uh, it is 2008's There Will Be Blood, yes. written and directed by P.T. Anderson, starring Daniel Day Lewis. Which we we've we've joked about wanting to do a Kubrick uh, retrospective yeah. for Mike's benefit, but I think we should really do a P.T. Anderson one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> God, I don't know that I can. I don't know that I can watch some of those movies again. Mike, didn't wow. you recently watch Boogie Nights for the first time? I did. Yeah, and you oh, didn't wow. care for it. I didn't like it. I, I liked that it. Movie. I, I liked it I for an hour, <laughs> <laughs> and then it got really long. I just love that movie. There, yeah. This is it's. It will turn into a tangent, but Mm. man, I I want to see Magnolia again. But again, it's it's a long movie. Did you guys see The Master? (sighs) Yeah, yeah. I wasn't crazy about that. I was drunk. I I wasn't drunk. I I drank like three beers before we went in. Keystone Art, great theater, great seats, great restroom facilities. I visited three times and during that movie, (laughs) um, to pee. But yeah. So anyway, so there will be blood. There will be what, blood. Uh, state um, your case. Yes. And uh, P.T. Anderson's almost, I'd almost say he's like a borderline obscure filmmaker because he's just not very mainstream, you know? That's what I would say. He's not He's not a mainstream Obs- filmmaker. Not obscure, but he's just not mainstream. Right, right. So I think a lot of people haven't seen Punch Drunk Love. A lot of people didn't see The Master. A lot of people saw Boogie Nights because mm-hmm. Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> And I think a lot of people saw There Will Be Blood for the most part. Not not a ton. It wasn't The Dark Knight. I don't think they did. It wasn't it wasn't in a whole lot of theaters. Yeah, but it became I think it I think it had a home video boom because the, the, uh-huh. yeah, it did. because of the Oscar. Right. Yeah. And, it was it was fairly mainstream. I mean, mm-hmm. they get a lot of Oscar attention. Yeah. His movies do, but I mean, yeah, I not a lot of screens though. Right. But I th- I think it had a big home movie Explosion. Uh, explosion is not the right word either. Um, <laughs> it had a big, a bit of a boom. It had because a push. It, yeah, and, and it struck oil. The scene that, because the scene that I'm talking about video. became a meme, sort of like on the <laughs> internet. Uh, before I really even knew what memes were. <laughs> right. Um, it's the whole the milkshake scene. I'm sure everybody knows. My what milkshake I'm, brings all the boys. <laughs> <out. Yeah. laughs> Damn it! I'm eyeing your bottle of water, and I want to just mimic it and be like, "I drink your water, I drink it up." <laughs> but I can't get the cadence. Dear right. God. <laughs> um, but Is that this, your impression? Do your impression. I can't do impressions. I drink your milkshake. Nice. I drink it up. I drink it up. Your bottle of water brings the boys to the yard. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's anyway, that's a good try. That's good. But anyway. uh, so the scene became very famous, and it became, uh, you know, a, a YouTube clip that people watched with uh, to that Khalees song, um, which is unfortunate because it sort of took away some of the. It changed the efficacy of the scene in the context of the film because 
the reason why I chose this scene, I chose it reluctantly because because of its legacy now with YouTube, but the con its context in the film is it's it is the this is the climax of the film, and it sums up or it just it just brings to a conclusion the the major conflict of the film the climax obviously um, it's uh it's brilliant because throughout this whole movie we have this character of Daniel Plainview and he's just a horrible person I mean I, he's not even an anti hero because you don't really root for him he's just a son of a bitch he's terrible mm-hmm. um, he's like he's like the main character but he's a villain um, and throughout it he will have these interactions with people and he is just the opposite of a people person (laughs) Uh, he even says it in the movie he just doesn't like people much Um, and so in order to succeed as a businessman in order to uh, fulfill his ambition and his his ego again um, is he has to kind of play this game with people throughout the movie Um, there's another famous scene where he agrees to be baptized even though he's not religious at all i love that scene it's so amazing much. paul dano is mm. i could not believe how well he kept up with with daniel day lewis oh, um, can i can i say about paul dano I, the i drink your milkshake that was kind of the world's introduction of paul dano right a uh, little miss sunshine little miss sunshine yeah uh did when did little miss sunshine come out Two, 2006 yeah was it 06 this okay was 08, yeah. yeah i guess so um but this was the war. I mean, this was when people realized who Paul Dano was. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. He. I mean, he was barely a main character in in Little Miss Sunshine. He was a but piece I, of an ensemble in Little I Miss Sunshine. I remember Paul Dano from The Girl Next Door. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. Huh. Which I saw in high school, where he plays Clitz, the <laughs> the nerdy best friend. Of, uh, of, uh, Emil Hirsch. The, the Emil Hirsch's character in that movie. <laughs> My god, that name. Why do you remember this? My- <laughs> because I really liked that movie a lot when I first saw it. Really? <laughs> oh, Alicia Cuthbert, wow. man. Oh my god, I love it. I her. forgot there was anybody else in the movie besides her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. I remember Emil Hirsch because I thought, I was like, man, this kid's gonna be somebody someday. Yeah. Yeah. And then he made one movie, and nobody ever heard from him again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was the What was the movie with the uh, with the uh, Matthew McConaughey that he made? Um. Oh my! It's right there on top of. Oh, my, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Into the Wilds. Yeah, the, but the one they made with. Uh, yeah, the one the one he made with Matthew McConaughey. He was just really over the top and really out of his element in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, he, but, I, I mean, he's in some good things. He was in He was in Milk, which I love. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alpha most dog. recently, Lone Survivor. Alpha Dog. Alpha Dog, Alpha dog. yes. Yeah. He's, I Gosh, like him in that. Good movie. Yeah. But anyway, Paul Anyways. Dano, right? So, <laughs> Clitz in the, in the Girl Next Door, just uh, a big dork. And I guess he's still kind of a dork in There Will Be Blood. Yeah. It was Killer Joe, by the way. Killer Joe. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 He was a little over top in that. Yeah. But in There Will Be Blood, he he was a he was a supporting role in a P.T. Anderson movie opposite Daniel Day Lewis. That's a huge, huge like role for him. Right. Yeah. Plus he was replacing an actor who had been fired. <laughs> who was so, originally cast? Uh, I have some no name. I don't know who it was. Huh. Or he never went anywhere, I guess. I think I remember hearing about that. Yeah. So and Paul, uh, actually Daniel Day Lewis recommended him because he had worked he had worked with Daniel Day Lewis's wife on the film they did. I can't remember the Battle of Jack and Rose, I think that's the name of that movie. Okay. Um, I haven't ever seen it, but anyways, um, so this scene is massively important because he's the character of Daniel Plainview has had to play this business game throughout his entire life. Uh, he has had to, uh, you know, kowtow and and stroke the ego of these people that he hates uh, just in order to achieve his goals. But now, at the end of the film, he is massively successful, unbelievably wealthy. And he can do whatever the hell he wants. He can treat people however he wants. Uh, and he gets this this man who comes to him who's sort of... He, he's his adversary throughout the bulk of the film. Um, he, he's the obstacle in the way of him achieving his goals in uh, this town of Boston, California, where he's trying to set up this oil drilling uh, endeavor. And 
he find the, the the guy this guy Paul Dano's character finally comes crawling to him uh you know hat in hand and asks him, asks him to to sell the final tract of land in this 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 town that Daniel Plainview has been looking for he he's been trying to 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 buy this land for decades um and also this is during the depression um, so he's especially desperate. It's, it's just a really, a really amazing context for this scene to happen. And Daniel Plainview just gets to throw it in his face <laughs> so hard. It's just, there's just so much egg on Paul Dano's face in this, mo- in this scene. It's just unbelievably good. Um, I, I love Daniel Day Lewis. I think, in my opinion, he is the greatest living actor currently. I, I think he's one of the greatest of all time. I think he's the he's the greatest living actor. Um but I ironically I think he he oftentimes will very very closely come to crossing the line of being over the top. Interesting. Very often in in, in his movies and I How think How so? Do you mean <laughs> <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> yeah, we all know what a straw sounds like. <laughs> Drinking a milkshake, you don't need to mimic it there. there. I think it's for emphasis, though, if I remember. Correctly. It is, but it's nuts. <laughs> um, yeah, and I and he's just like drainage, and just like it's like he's like shaking and convulsing and drooling. It's like simmer down, buddy. Yeah, that's a good. Point. <laughs> but it does not change the weight of this scene. Hey, just so you know, we uh, are going to spoil the ending of There Will Be Blood, so if you don't want to hear that, uh, check the show notes and skip to the next timestamp. Thank you. Um, and, and, and spoiler alert, it, 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 it culminates to such a crescendo that uh, he bludgeons the man to death with a bowling pin. I mean, that's that is the disdain that he has been harboring for this person for <laughs> decades um and it, it's just it's just an amazing scene and i just love i just love the words he uses in this in this scene and the way he just there's just tension that's this 10 foot high tension that's sitting between these two characters and he's just he just makes him beg and just the way he does it it's just unbelievably good uh good writing and just i love the words <laughs> and and bludges, bludgeons him, by the way, with like this status symbol, right? He has yeah. a bowling alley in his home. <laughs> I was going to say that. And it's during the Depression, so right. it's, it's yeah, just... Yeah, right, exactly. It's he had, amazing. He has a bowling alley in his home during a time when no one had bowling alleys in their home. Yeah. <laughs> right. like it's, so it's... Ki- killing, killing this man, destroying this man, defeating this man, finally, mm-hmm. um, putting him in his place like in the place that is lavish with one of the things uh that it is a symbol of his wealth mm-hmm. awesome yeah. it is yeah it's really and, you know almost the 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 scene where he he throws this in his face that he doesn't even need this tract of land that could literally be the salvation of this man uh that scene the actual dialogue scene and the murder scene are are kind of almost two different scenes really so I mean I guess he is kind of yelling at him the whole time <laughs> that he's chasing him around. So I guess it is part of the scene, but I- I'm saying I think it still qualifies as a dialogue scene, even though there is right. this huge moment of action in it. Because yeah. um, I think that's kind of a parameter of a dialogue scene is that it's it's about what he's saying, not a- it's about what these characters are saying, not what they're doing. But uh-huh. obviously in this scene, it's kind of about what he does right. when he kills the guy. <laughs> But uh, I, I think it matters because the first two thirds of the scene is all about him saying these horrific things to this guy, right? <laughs> so um, I I love this scene so much. It, it is, like I said, it's just such a perfect climax for the movie. Nice. Yeah. I I really need to watch it again, but I I agree completely. Yeah. I'll say it's the one P.T. Anderson movie I really enjoy. I liked it a lot. <laughs> nice. Nice. I love. Of the two, you know, the two of them were going head for head, head to head at the Oscars, uh, that movie and, um, No Country, no Country for, for Old Men. Old Men. Oh, yeah. yeah. And while I liked most of No, no Country better, I'm, I'm one of the people who is not a fan of the ending. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, There Will Be Blood sticks the landing. So I'll give it that. 
Yeah. Nice. And they were also filmed within miles of each other. Oh, cool. Which That's is very right. funny. Yeah. Nice. Some of the scenes that they shot for No Country for Old Men were ruined because of the, when they burned down the oil derrick and the, the, the smoke was so high in the air that it actually ruined some scenes. That's right. Yeah. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, Cool. Yeah, uh, I agree. I've got nothing more to add. Um, <laughs> nice. All right. So next up, uh, is it my turn? You. Oh wow. Okay. So I'm cheating a little bit here. Well, no, I'm not. I'm I'm gonna pick one scene. But uh, I just want to say, just the whole damn movie of Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. Hmm. Uh, this was, if you guys remember from, uh, <laughs> this is a weird comparison, but um, our Summer Sandler uh, episodes when we talked about Click. I made the remark that oh yeah when I when I went to watch Click on Netflix it it had my rating from when I was like 15 um and it was like a one star rating and then I watched it and it was like it's like a four star movie to me on mm-hmm. that or like three stars I can't three remember which one yeah so so like this was one where I had it marked wait, 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 wait. you gave Click four stars three and a half stars three and a half three and a half four I was very moved by it um uh, oh good okay this time yeah yep. um I've just blocked out Summer of Sam <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, so have I. Your pet project. <laughs> yeah. I know. You are taking yeah. the blame for that. I guess I have to. <laughs> Spring of Stanley. I Kubrick. would really rather do a, a Kubrick <laughs> retrospective than a P.T. Anderson retrospective. P.T. Anderson would take less time, though. Less movies. <sighs> Just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I'd rather, I'd rather do Kubrick as well. I, yeah, me too. I, I don't know what I'd do. Anyways. Anyway, so. It doesn't matter because the next retrospective is Fincher. Um, <laughs> now that I can get down with. Yep. yep. End of January, hopefully. Sweet. So anyway, um, just this is a movie that I had a three, uh, like a three star rating on Netflix. It was, so it was like liked it, um, but man, I just bumped it right up to the max. Like loved it um, because this is a movie that it's. Uh, adapted from David Mamet's play by David Mamet, and just the dialogue is so organic and so powerful that it's it's one of it's a collection of actors giving some of the best performances I've ever seen on film, hmm. and it's just remarkable. It made me miss the hell out of Jack Lemmon. <laughs> um, but it's it's about a, just a group of salesmen who are kind of like going through a, a drought, I guess. I, it's it's they're they're trying to get leads uh, to make new sales for this for this uh, um, uh, sales prize thing introduced by Alec Baldwin in the iconic "Always Be Closing" scene, where he in "Coffee Is for Closers" scene. Put um, down that coffee cup. Yeah, <laughs> coffee is for closers. Um, Anyway, um, which is a Fallout Boy song. It is. So anyway, um, it's it's great that it's so great that movie is that that scene alone is iconic. But I'm not talking about that scene because the entire movie is just like I, I was I was uh so wrapped by the movie that every scene before and after that scene was like that scene to me. Like I got I got the same kind of reaction. Um, cause I was just so enthralled by the movie. But the scene I really want to talk about, and it's, it's going into spoiler territory, so I'm gonna, I mean, it's a, kind of an older movie, but I'm going to be, you know, a little delicate here. But, um, Jack Lemon's character is a down on his luck salesman who is struggling to get sales and, and facing potential firing. Um, and so he comes in like the the big like third act of the movie is after the the uh, the office has been robbed and and the the Glen Gary leads, which are the premium leads, uh, have been stolen. So he comes in all like excited and happy because he made a sale, and there's just an incredibly powerful scene between him and Kevin Spacey, who plays kind of the 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 boss of the office, the the guy in charge of all the salesmen, and they just, it's just the way that. Um, Jack Lemon gives he gives everything into this performance and the way that he delivers all of these lines and 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 the way that the scene unfolds um Kevin Spacey kind of takes the wind out of his sails um 
sales. Not a pun. Um, <laughs> so, God. God damn it. Um, so anyway, he takes the, he takes the wind out of his sales. Um, because uh, he basically tells him this is spoilery, but the the sale that he had made off screen before the before the third act is just a dump. It, it's not. It's worthless. And just the way that. The way that um, the way that Jack Lemmon just just plays off of that, and and the way that the, the 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 dialogue plays out throughout that sequence, it's another one of those examples where the ebb and flow of it dictates the the tone and 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 the uh, the atmosphere of the scene, and you can kind of go through all of these different these different emotions as a viewer as watching these scenes because this guy is this guy is like chipper and everything you kind of you don't know if you can really trust him because there's been a break-in in the office um and then you can he just gets just completely deflated and then he's he's fighting for his survival because kevin spacey has him in a corner and he's like he basically takes out money and is like hey here's twenty five thousand dollars or twenty five hundred dollars uh take it just take it and he he's he's putting on the brilliance of it is that he's putting it on as a salesman He's like he's try he's negotiating with Kevin Spacey for power in this scene that he has no power in. And it's it's just it's a beautifully, beautifully acted and beautifully written scene. And the entire movie is just filled with the those kind of power dynamics and, and um just really incredible, incredible performances. Um, I love it. And I, I looked it up while, while we were recording earlier, while we were talking earlier. And, uh, and I, I need to have, this needs to have like a bigger, like DVD or Blu-ray release with like a bunch of commentaries and features, but it doesn't. It should be a criterion. It really but, should. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, so that, that's mine. I have, what do you guys have on Glenn Gary and Glenn Ross? Uh, you know, full disclosure. <laughs> I saw this movie when I was like 15 <laughs> and that's the last time I saw it. Wow. And that's, it was about the same as me. Yeah. And, and it was just, it was, I think it was over my head as a 15 year old and it, uh, I, I really should revisit it. <laughs> um, I, I appreciated parts of it, but I, I, I barely remember it. Yeah. It will, on one hand, it's going to blow your mind. I bet it will. And on the second hand, it's going to make you kind of hate Boiler Room a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, watch it. Like, watch it tonight. <laughs> okay. I'm not laughing. Wow. <laughs> Jeez, this is getting no. weird. Anyway, so, <laughs> Mike, have you seen... Also, full disclosure, I've never seen it. I, I'm only familiar with the Coffee's for Closers scene. Yeah. Cool. So I've seen the movie. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Um... Check it out though, guys, because my God, it's if you guys want to see some incredible performances. I remember being blown away by so much of it. Yeah. Just like, wow, this is written really. And this, this, I mean, I saw it when I was starting to come into my own as a movie fan, mm-hmm. like develop a taste, which we we talked about that before. And this was around that time, and so I was starting to be like, you know what? I think this is written pretty well. <laughs> and, I think this is good. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like I like what these guys are saying and how they're saying it. This is good. Uh, I think I like this movie. <laughs> um, so that that's kind of what I remember. I remember those sentiments running through fifteen year old Tiny's brain. I just remember when I saw it as a as a young man, I was like, there are no women in this movie that I can look up later. Um, <laughs> anyway, huh. um, uh, final thoughts on on Glenn Gary Glenn, Gary, Glenn Ross, um, Jack Lemmon's performance, which I and just awestruck of uh his character was the basis of old gill in uh, the simpsons huh. uh and, and, and the mannerisms and it, it's like they got they got his mannerisms for for gill yeah. um throughout the simpsons and then also there's something about his performance i there's something about his energy and the way that he i, I think it's kind of the way that he goes through different emotional ranges like in like just at the drop of the hat and in the in mid sentence as he kind of rises and falls through emotions while while he's trying to sell he's trying to sell people things and he the way that he does that it there's something about it that just reminds me of Brian Cranston huh and it's it I I'm kind of curious I maybe I shouldn't have said anything cuz I kind of want to see if you guys would have that same reaction if you saw it too but there was something about it. I, I don't know if it was his facial expressions or the way that he uses hand gestures and stuff, but there's there's something about just the way that he delivers his lines that has just a Cranston feel to me. Because hmm. Cranston's just, he's incredible at, at 
doing the same thing, uh, going through a range of emotions and in, in just in in the middle of lines of dialogue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, nice yeah, your guys' homework is to watch Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. <laughs> um, yeah. So, Mike, what's your uh, what's your next one? All right. So, and this should probably be the last one if we want. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we'll do like a quick round of honorable mentions or something. So, P.T. Anderson, <laughs> Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. What was the first one you did, Tiny? Uh, Charlie Wilson's, Charlie Wilson's War. War. Charlie Wilson's War. Sorkin. Sorkin. I feel like I'm a little out of my league here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Not really. I, I I know all these movies, and I kind of. I kind of decided to go with a popular one that really speaks to my sensibilities uh, and kind of talk about a movie that I don't think people would think of or even a genre, a genre that people would think of when they think of great dialogue in movies. And I want to talk about one of my favorite movies of all time, Vacation. Nice. Nice. Okay. What, why nice. do you say that so hesitantly? I- I wasn't hesitant. I was just because I have in my notes. I completely forgot that you chose that, and I have in my notes the one of your other ones, and I was like kind of thrown by it. Um, but go ahead, yeah, vacation, amazing. What were you? What did? What did you want me to talk about? Oh, I didn't. It, this was out of date and out of date list. But what I mean? Oh, do you uh, to talk about few good men. Goodwill Hunting. Goodwill Hunting. Would you rather yeah. I talk about that? Would you have more to say about it? No, I'd have more to say about vacation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, I want to talk about vacation. For a number of reasons, we talked about how we want to pick a line of dialogue that is um, be- the best example of the theme of the entire movie. And so the th- the th- um, the scene after they crash the station wagon uh, and Clark Griswold is played by Chevy Chase, of course, is trying to figure out what to do. Uh, he calls his son Rusty over, and they have a little heart to heart. One of one of several throughout the franchise, um, you know, father son moments that, that the movie kind of became known for. And the line, you know, good talk, Russ, was, <laughs> has kind of, um, become a common thing. Um, so I just, what I did with this, cause you can't really talk about brilliant direction, um, acting performance. I mean, it's a comedy. It, it, it's, uh, I'm not trying to make more out of it than what it really is it's a comedy but uh, i just made note of in the span of like a minute and a half just the number of jokes and and how they work so for starters um chevy chase is walking up and he kind of doesn't turn around but he shouts, hey rusty come up here uh and then rusty who is like a foot away from him is like <laughs> i'm here daddy and he goes, oh oh <laughs> which is a very Chevy Chase kind of thing, right? And if we're talking about what is the theme of the movie, well, Chevy Chase is an idiot. There you go. <laughs> um, and so he, he starts to talk to Russ, and he says, well, you've been a man. Um, he says, you're a man now, and you have to understand, blah, blah, blah. And Russ says, well, I've only been a man for a few days, which is a reference to a joke earlier in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when... He is, when Clark tells the story uh, to Russ, uh, played by Anthony Michael Hall, of when he was younger and his family used to go on vacation every summer when, when he was a kid, uh, and they were always terrible. As he's telling this story, he takes his glasses out of his pocket and puts them on, okay? But the glasses are broken and split down the middle. And so he's talking and kind of shaking his head and the glasses fall apart and fall off. And it's just the perfect example of that brilliant physical comedy that, that Chevy Chase, when he's on, mm-hmm. is known for. Um, just the, the complete lack of acknowledgement of these glasses just sliding off his face <laughs> is brilliant. That is that Chevy Chase thing that he started and really has – has been imitated several times, but it's it's just not as good as the way right. Chevy Chase does it. And so I I bring that up because I think that for me is a big uh, source of humor is is not addressing um, some of the funny things that are happening and just letting those funny things happen while you while you kind of experience a scene. Um. And then, of course, there's an easy joke where he talks about, you know, I love spending time with you and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> he can't remember Audrey, his, his daughter's name. 
And then uh, another just visual uh, physical gag when he he and Rusty split a beer and he gives the beer to Rusty and and he's telling the story about how every time he went on vacation uh, it was miserable and he just wants to have a good family vacation. Russ kills the beer. <laughs> and, and so Chevy Chase doesn't realize that he he's killed the beer and so he gives it back to him and, and you see Chevy just try to take sips from it. Um, I... I could have said Goodwill Hunting, and if we did mm-hmm. another one, I, I would have said more to say about a m- right. more important movie to me, I think, um, just because I love Robin Williams in that movie. Mm-hmm. But Vacation spoke to me on so many levels as a young person who whose identity rested on trying to be funny all the time. Um, I mean, Chevy Chase, to me, in the late 80s and the 90s was an idol. So discovering him and then rediscovering some of the jokes later on as a teenager when I watched it in high school, it just it just meant so much to me. And I think this talk is such a good example of everything Chevy Chase was about, everything the vacation movies were about. Uh, and it's just, it's just great. Plus, Anthony Michael Hall is wearing a Cubs t-shirt, so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, I, I, again, it's been... Oh man, so many years since I've seen Vacation. It's it's bad, really. I need to see it again. Really? Yeah, yeah. it's been huh. many. I mean, I think I was probably in high school last time I saw it. Really? Wow. Yeah, it's time. Huh. It is. Um, it but is. I'm trying to remember it. I th- I think I know the scene you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, s- scenes you're talking about. Um, I re- I re- I think it's a great one for you to bring up. I like this pick a lot, and I think it's because I sort of remember. I remember all the jokes, and it just mm-hmm. being hilarious and just brilliant joke density to, to use your term, Mike. Uh, um, yeah, thank you. But I think it's also a great scene because I think uh, um, Chevy Chase is being, his character, he's being very earnest. Like he's saying, he's he's expressing an earnest sentiment that he really, you know, he's actually, he's, he's having a really positive and heartfelt heart to heart with his son like it's 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 mm-hmm. like yeah it's hilarious but it's also very touching at the same time yeah mm-hmm. so Absolutely. It, ma- it makes sense that it would stick out oh yeah absolutely um, i haven't i actually haven't seen vacation in a, a, a while but <laughs> I'm, I'm actually kind of i'm i'm hoping that i i can do like a franchise review around christmas huh, nice we'll see but um yeah good pick i, I yeah I've got, I've got nothing else to add to it. That was summed up beautifully. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. So, do you guys want to do? Do we want to give like one like really quick lightning round honorable yeah. mention? That's cool. Um, yeah, I'll I'll go ahead and go first. Um, okay. If you're gonna seek out when Gary Glenn Ross, which you all should. Both of you <laughs> specifically, um, <laughs> make it a double feature with uh, Twelve Angry Men. Nice. Uh, okay. Beautiful we'll dialogue. Beautiful. Another, they're kind of they're similar. They're very similar. Um, mm-hmm. uh, male cast, um, dialogue heavy, dialogue driving the driving the plot all, uh, and kind of confined into one area for the most part. They're, I mean, Glenn Glare and Glenn Ross has different sets and everything, but it's it's all kind of confined. There's a confinement there, but um, yeah, Twelve Angry Men's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, both on Netflix, I believe. Nice. Yeah. Sweet. Tiny? Uh, mine is the film. I'm sure a lot of you haven't heard of it. That sounded douchey. I don't mean like this is such a cool movie. I'm just saying, unfortunately, a lot of people haven't seen this movie. It's called Hunger. Uh, oh, it's also yeah. from, I think, like 2009, 2008, nine. I want to say there. eight, but yeah. Yeah. Um, in the movie, there's a scene where the main character is having a discussion with his priest about whether or not he should convince everyone he's in prison with to go on a hunger strike and essentially kind of commit suicide. Uh, and it's a 20 minute scene. It is a 20 minute static shot, but you cannot take your eyes off of the screen. It is it's unbelievably so good. Great. Yeah. Hmm. Definitely see that movie if you has, if you have not. Yep. Nice. And Mike, what do you got, buddy? Uh, I would just say, like I said, I was going to talk about, uh, Goodwill hunting and in particular, the scene, uh, where, um, Robin Williams' character Sean takes Will, played of course by Matt Damon, out to the bench, uh, and kind of and kind of sets it straight and says, um, basically, 
you could tell me all about the Sistine Chapel, but you have no idea what it smells like. Uh, and then, of course, it, it culminates in him saying, uh, you know, I, I, just because I read uh, Oliver Twist, I, I don't have any idea what it's like to be an orphan. And, and it's just that, that breakthrough moment. And it's, I did not see Dead Poet Society until later on. Uh, and so this was kind of my first, my first glimpse of, of Rob Williams as a, as a dramatic actor. And it's just, it's just brilliant. It, it made me cry again. We watched it after, after his death and it's just awesome. It's so good. I love those apples so much. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, good, good one. Yeah. Good pick. Nice. Um, Hey guys, it's Pat and Tyler, and we are the co-hosts of the Nerds You're Looking For podcast. We're just two nerds that love talking about nerd stuff, whether it be comics, video games, movies, or TV shows. We start every episode off talking about what we're into. We talk about how we've become the nerds we are today. We go through our nerd news, all the breaking nerd news throughout the week, and we end each episode with a review or a top five of something in pop culture that we love. It is a bi-weekly podcast that posts every other Monday. You can find all of our episodes on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and our companion blog, thenerdspodcast.com. And we are the nerd you're looking for. Take it easy, guys. See ya. Yeah, so, okay, this uh, transitions. Should go to potpourri. Let's do a little <laughs> sure. potpourri. Yeah, man, we haven't done one in a long, it's long been a time. Oh, no, how long. do we do this? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll bring us in. Uh... All right, we're going to move on to potpourri, which is, if this is your first time listening, it's uh, the section where we talk about whatever we want, whatever we've watched lately, what we're excited for, any news, whatever, um, in the movie and TV world. Uh, anything we want, as long as it smells good. So, tiny. Yeah, we can go the same order. I'll start us off. Oh, yeah, that is the same order, isn't it? Yeah. Nice. Um, I've been dying to talk with somebody about this movie. Um I don't think you guys have seen it. It's a film on um, Netflix Instant. You so everybody, please go watch it. This movie came out in 2013. It is called Blue Ruin. Yeah, most people probably never heard of it. <laughs> it, it recently got put on Netflix Instant. Uh, I think within the past couple months, handful of months. Um, man, if if I had seen the movie in 20, in 2013, it would have absolutely been on my top 10 list. Oh, wow. Um, that's how good it was. I, I would have kicked something off. It may have even been in the top five. That's how good this movie is. Um, it's, it's sort of about this, this man who had his life ruined by a crime that was committed on his family. Okay. And he's essentially become a destitute homeless man. And the person who committed this crime on his family is being released from prison. And the movie just kind of goes from there. It reminds me a lot of, it's kind of topical, it reminds me a lot of um, No Country for Old Men. Oh, nice. Um, A little grittier version of that. Um, Remove the the polish of the Coen brothers and you kind of have an idea of what this movie is like. It is so brilliant. There's no one... Famous in it, not even close. I was just gonna ask. <laughs> bunch of no names. Uh, and the the director, writer director, never heard of him. Huh. He's done a bunch of shorts. This is his first big feature length movie. It's 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 like a narrative fiction, right? It's it's fiction. It is fiction. Okay. Yes. Yes. Because I wasn't because you've been watching a lot of documentaries on I have Netflix been, yeah. lately. I have been. So yeah. I wasn't sure. Um, no, it's not a documentary. This is fiction. Um, it is so so good. Um, actually, the one kind of famous person is uh, Devin Rattray. Uh, he was uh, <laughs> Buzz McAllister from Home Alone. Oh, nice. wow. Yeah. I know, right? Huh. I haven't seen him in anything since Home Alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's in it, and he's actually really good. I like him a lot oh. in the movie. Um, I think you'll... When you see it, Matt, and you're going to see it. Um, oh, I added it to my list just now. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um I think you'll relate to it because as a security guard, I think we, we, we've met this kind of person before. <laughs> nice. Um, and he plays it to a T. It's really good. So Very nice. Uh, the movie is just phenomenal. It is a phenomenal story. Um, cool. Please check it out. I don't want to go into more detail. I just want you guys to see it. Um, and please send me an email or something about it because I need to talk to somebody <laughs> about it. It's so good. So, um, nice. Blue Ruin. Please go check it out. Nice. And Tiny's email is tiny at obsessiveviewer.com. It is. 
So, Mike, what do you what do you got for us? You want to go next? Yeah. Um, for my birthday yesterday. By the way, this is my birthday episode. Yeah, happy birthday, oh. man! How Thanks, was it? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yesterday, I saw Interstellar, but we're gonna talk about that way in depth. That's yeah, that's next, next week. week's episode. So before that, I saw Nightcrawler in theaters. Was this a double feature? Because I thought you said it was. It was a double feature. Nice. We saw we saw Nightcrawler and Saint Vincent. Nice. Okay. And Saint Vincent was really, really, really cute. Uh, mm. And if I had seen that on any other night, I would have probably liked it even more. However, it was paired with Nightcrawler, which just blew me away. Yep. This uh, movie was so so good. And and people ask me. Um, for recommendations all the time because they know I do the show. They know that I see movies every week. Uh, and so like colleagues, right? My colleagues, uh, <laughs> ask me at work, how is the movie? Should I go see it? And I always kind of have to temper my answers, uh, based on who is asking. And so a lot of, a lot of the, um, <laughs> A lot of the people I work with, I don't think would like Nightcrawler all that much because of how ridiculously just, just gritty and bleak and just awful it makes you feel about the world. I felt similarly at the end of it, uh, as I feel at the end of seven, right? Mm, just, wow. just gross. Just, just <laughs> like, oh, this is so icky. You feel icky. Um, mm -hmm. and I just love the trajectory of Jake Gyllenhaal's career. And one of the fun things to think about for me is what if Prince of Persia was a hit? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That where movie, would he whoa. be? Right. That movie sucks that, so much. He would probably be doing Prince of Persia three. He, now. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. That you just blew my mind. I, yeah. That just blew my mind. <laughs> Good. Huh. Um, but since then, of course, he's done Source Code. He's done one of my favorite movies of all time, Prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Nightcrawler, which might also be one of my favorite movies of all time. We're getting to that end of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. We got only a couple weeks left to start thinking about what our top movies of the year are. Nightcrawler is absolutely there uh, and might be a top three. Nice. For me. I, I, yeah, I agree. I, I wrote a review of it on the blog and I rated it a blind buy, which would have qualified for a 9.0 on the new 10 point mm -hmm. scale thing. Mm -hmm. Um, man, Gosh, I it loved was it. It was so icky, wasn't it? It was in, in Gyllenhaal's performance. Yeah. Right. That's I what mean, stuck out to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, definitely. it was insane. It was like, I kept, like, <laughs> I was watching it and I kept thinking, like, okay, how can I, like, I, like just like t like i just kept thinking in my head like okay this is a movie about basically uh uh sociop sociopathy is that a, is that an actual word sociopath a sociopath but like socio sociopathology sociopathy. sociopathy i think that's a word it's about a sociopath with ambition <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's what i'm trying to say it's that's just what and it's it's so so strong on on all fronts um it works so many ways it it works as the character study of mm -hmm. this sociopath and psychopath yeah uh it works as kind of a buzz on news media yeah and all that. oh yeah uh, uh Rene Russo's character is a perfect like mirror to that like she's almost Absolutely. she's almost a mirror to Jillian Hall's psychopathy or whatever you want to call it. Um, She's, she would be a sociopath. He is okay, both, yeah. but she would be a sociopath. Okay, yeah, yeah. And it's it's so – it feels so unexpected to me. Um, yeah. uh, but it, it's such a it's – such a, and it doesn't beat you over the head with its, with its kind of treatment of um, uh, news media or, or cutthroat stuff. Um, but it's, it's, it's still there though. I mean just like <laughs> you want to talk about – I don't know if this would. I don't. Yeah, this would probably qualify as a, as a good dialogue scene, but also just just your word, Mike. Gross. Um, mm -hmm. I won't go. I won't go into spoilers for it, but um, the negotiation scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My God. That was amazing. It, yeah. It's. I have like no words for it. I just. I it. It was one of those movies that just just 
emotionally affected me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was all Gyllenhaal, his, his mm-hmm. performance and the way that R- Rene Rousseau played off him. Uh, yeah, but the movie wasn't all Gyllenhaal. He he's oh, right, fantastic. Right. Oh yeah. But uh I'll tell you the the two climactic um scenes of tension. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll just say uh-huh. the one at the house and mm-hmm. then the the climax of the movie. Yes. Yes. Are are just literally edge of your seat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um so so intense. Yeah, and a uh, uh, first time director too, D- Dan Gilroy. Mm-hmm. Um, and man, it, it was shot incredibly well. It was. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, there's a scene where uh, he's using his camera and he's putting it above his head to try to get uh, an overhead shot of something, right? And so uh, the cut is from a, a victim. No spoiler there. It's mm-hmm. from a victim. Cut to the camera, and then the the our camera pans down to his face, which is stark white, and he and he looks uh funny enough, kind of like Michael Myers. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's it's Just so creepy. he it's was so great. He was like a mad scientist in that scene. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was really great. And it's the 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 movie is such an interesting. The story is set in such an interesting environment because I, I wouldn't expect to – it's so obvious having seen it, but I wouldn't expect to see that kind of character in the world of news production. You know what I mean? It's, right. Yeah. It sounds so so simple and so like just, just blasé, but mm. when you think about it, it's like, of course – that this kind of work would attract a crazy person because <laughs> right. it's so self-serving. It's it's not. It is such an unsympathetic endeavor mm-hmm. that of course you would have a person like this do, doing it. And and yeah, just to throw my hat in, I I feel I think I I like it just a sliver less than you guys, mm-hmm. but it's it's definitely in my top ten of the year without question. Maybe top five, um, but I feel like a majority. I feel like a majority of the quality of the film is is hoisted onto Jake Gyllenhaal's performance. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's the best I've seen him. Well, I mean, I, there's some movies I might need to revisit, like Prisoners and and Brokeback Mountain and stuff like that. But uh, I think it's probably his best. Prisoners, Prisoners is not an acting movie. Prison, right? They're great in it, but that's a that's a story. True, very true. Yeah. Whereas this is absolutely an acting movie. An acting movie. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so his his performance, the the uh, the movie hinges on that performance. If you have a just a par or a mediocre performance, this movie does not work at all. So, right. uh, yeah, that that's what really gripped me when I saw this. Yeah. 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 It's very good. Yeah, uh, I loved it. It'll be interesting to see what happens uh, come award time. It made me. It made me want to go buy a Dodge Challenger more than any commercial <laughs> ever. <laughs> oh man, that car is beautiful. It's so awesome. Me. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess that brings it to me, right? Yes, sir. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna bring us down a little bit. Um, <laughs> not not bring us down, but kind of you know, a little light lighten it up a bit. Um, I was privy to a uh, an, an early screening of Ho- uh, Horrible Bosses Two. Hmm. Uh, as pa- tell me, okay. Well, I don't want to know anything about it. Okay. Uh, as part of uh, uh GoFobo, GoFobo dot com. I I don't even remember. Like you sign up and they'll send you occasional emails saying like, oh hey, there's gonna be a free screening uh of this movie that's coming out. Uh, here's your passes. Get there early, and it's free. So I'm like, all right, cool. Um, I, I don't know the. Uh, it happens every now and then. I get to go to it, and it's fun. Um, I won't give much away or anything, but I, <laughs> I, I laughed throughout the movie, and I was, I loved it. Um, I really liked, I really liked horrible Bo- the original horrible bosses, the first one in 2011. Um, I thought it was really funny. It was really good. Um. Because of the uh, chemistry between Sudeikis, Bateman, and Charlie Day, yeah, and it's just it's like they didn't leave like, at all. It's like this this is just a continuation of that same chemistry. And hmm. and I was thinking about it, and what makes it work so well with them is that it's it's this this trio 
plays off each other so well because one is kind of the kind of, one's the straight man. Jason Bateman's the total straight man, but he's also he he's not like the he doesn't suck away any of the comedy. It's just mm-hmm. he's he's a straight man with great dry comedic timing, um, as Bateman is known for. And then Charlie Day is his usual kind of goofy self and kind of kind of the the foil wild card bitches <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but he's also just. He also has a certain um, levity, I guess, or perfect, um, perfect comedic timing as just Charlie Day. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really strong. And then, and then, uh, Sudeikis is, <laughs> he's just, he's an ass, <laughs> but you love him. Like he's, he's an ass, <laughs> but you would help him move if he offered you a pizza or something. Like yeah. he's like, he's, he's that <laughs> likable. I, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's really funny and what I what I really appreciated about it was that it doesn't it doesn't fall into the trap of sequels uh notably comedy sequels. I mean like 22 Jump Street I I really Let me let me say let me oh, say go this. Right let ahead. me put this out there and ask this. Mm-hmm. Um I was really bothered by this movie by the idea of this movie because the first one worked in that they were regular guys tr- trying to do something criminal, right? Mm-hmm. They were going to be criminals, and then they realized they didn't want to be criminals. But the trailers set them up like they're going full criminal in this movie, and that kind of bothers me. It's it's not. Are really, my fears assuaged? It is. They are. I, I think you'll be fine. Um, okay. It's it's not. There's a. They set up the circumstances. For for them to to return to their life of crime uh very well is there is a there is a reason to it and it's uh <laughs> there's there's such a stupid stupid gag uh um involving a whiteboard where they're brainstorming and it's 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 such a stupid throwaway gag but it made me la- <laughs> it made me laugh so hard because solely because of Bateman's facial expression cuz it's so it's just him. He's just so dry and so so great in 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 uh, that moment. But um, but the the movie set up well, and that's one of the things that I really appreciated about it is that it doesn't fall into the trap of sequels and comedy sequels spe- uh, specifically. Like Twenty Two Jump Street was was meta almost to a fault like by saying like okay we're going to do the same thing we did last time we're going to do the same thing we're going to do the same thing there's like yeah three or four instances where they make reference to them doing the same thing and it's not necessarily the same thing but with horrible bosses too they're doing something different it's not like it's not like they're after the events of the first movie they are still um employed by uh horrible bosses that they want to kill it's like there are circumstances that lead to them to do a different kind of crime and it's and it's the supporting cast is also really great um uh i will say that christoph waltz was a little underused Hmm. um but chris pine is amazing um isn't he always he's it he's he's amazing in that in this in this because he plays such a great like comedic role in in this movie do you remember him in uh in smoke and aces i've been meaning to watch that movie again lately yeah i never saw it i remember not loving it all that much but it's been a while it looked a lot cooler than it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I remember it going up against Lucky Number Eleven, and I liked Eleven better. Yeah. Uh, I really liked Lucky Number Eleven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and it makes me kind of wish that Josh Hartnett, Josh Hartnett, Still did, acted. <laughs> did anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think he's on. Is he on uh, Penny Dreadful? That show with yes, yes. Oh, he is. Yeah, I did that. not know that. Yeah, um, Ava Green show on Showtime. Okay, nice. There I'll you check go. that out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> His face just lit up like a yeah. Christmas tree. Ava Green on cable. Yep. All right. <laughs> on premium cable. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm there. But um, yeah, I, uh, yeah. So horrible bosses too is good. Um, cool. Yeah, and I, I completely spaced that uh, Dumb and Dumber Two's out, and I'm kind of nervous about it. I don't think it's getting that good of reviews. No, mm. it's not. We're seeing that next week. But yeah. you know what? The first one didn't get good reviews either. The first one is a stupid movie That's and true. it's now a cult classic. So, yeah. 
That's true. People can get over themselves. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that about does it, though, guys. Yep, um, that'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we had some really good dialogue in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Could have used some walk and talking, but <laughs> right, you know. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Um. Anyway, uh. Oh, real quick, Mike, have you listened to any of Serial? By the way. No, I've been meaning to, but I haven't. You really should. It's very good. It's I right. listened right. to episode eight today. I I'm still two episodes behind. Oh really? Did you see Did you see that uh that clip that parody clip I sent you? I haven't watched it. Oh though. my god, it's so funny. All right, I haven't seen it. Wrap this sucker it's, up. <laughs> it's really funny. Okay. Um. So anyway, uh, yeah, I guess we're gonna throw it to our pre-recorded outros. So, again, uh, thank you for listening, guys, and I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks. Thanks for listening, folks. <laughs> thanks, guys. Peace. Seriously, so many notes for Interstellar. I- I'm excited for this episode. I'm nervous now. I'm, I've only seen it once. I wasn't able to take notes. Yeah, I I've just been thinking a lot about it, and like, yeah, it'll it'll be a good. It'll be a really good conversation. I'm sure. Yeah, I think it will. <laughs> um. So you okay? So <laughs> it, it didn't it didn't make it better seeing it a second time? Uh. We'll talk about it Sunday. <laughs> I liked it a lot. I liked it. I liked it quite a bit more than I did the first time. Okay. Um, nice. With some caveats. Like I said, it's going to be a good. I like. I'm. I. I don't know if I've been this excited about an episode mm-hmm. in a while. Like, look at all these notes I have, Tiny. It starts here. Okay. Well, that's it. But they're all like <laughs> really good points. <laughs> okay. As always, loyal listeners, thank you for listening to the Obsessive Viewer Podcast. And thank you, of course, to Loud Like for providing our awesome opening theme music. Their first EP, uh, their first of a few actually coming out in the next few months. Check them out. Uh, anyway, it's called Mistakes We Must Make and features our theme song and a clips of events. Um, make sure that you rate and review us on iTunes after you listen to this episode. It helps us out a lot uh, and it gives us the ability to say, hey, people like us. Also, please like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash the obsessive viewer, and you can follow each of us on Twitter. You can find Matt at obsessive viewer, tiny is obsessive tiny, and me, Mike, I'm at I am Mike White on Twitter. You can also check out the blog at obsessiveviewer.com where all three of us, but mostly Matt, review movies and TV shows and uh, talk about all kinds of things. It's kind of the, the written form of this podcast. Um, you can also check out Obsessive Book Nerd, which has book reviews and commentary on the evolving world of reading. And also check out Tiny's The Secular Perspective, which is a podcast exploring the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts. Um, if you have any thoughts on the podcast in general or this particular podcast you just listened to, or even suggestions for future podcasts, please, please email us individually at Matt, Tiny, or Mike at ObsessiveViewer.com, or you can just email the podcast directly as a whole kind of directed to all three of us at podcast at obsessiveviewer.com again thank you so much for listening we love you be excellent to each other <laughs> <laughs>